morning po sa lahat. And um, we will now be proceeding to our sermon. Ang ating pong sermon delivery is co- will be coming from Reverend Nolly Malibuyo, ang ating founding pastor. And this was originally preached last June 26, 2022. And as we start, allow me to read this. In 1983, noong 1983 daw po, Roman Catholic Cardinal Roman Catholic Cardinal Bernardine wrote We have also opposed the death penalty He's talking about death penalty here because we do not think its use cultivates an attitude of respect for life in society At hindi lang po yun yung uh, dineclare dito sa sa Uh, sinulat na ito. Even pagdating sa abortion, meron siyang sinulat. Sabi dito, The principle is at the heart of Catholic teaching on abortion. It is because the fetus is judged to be both human and not aggressor that Catholic teaching concludes that direct attack on fetal life is always wrong. That was the announcement. And then in 1955, Pope John Paul II said, The direct and voluntarily or voluntary killing of an innocent human being is always gravely immoral. And what is remarkable in Pope's statement is he included the word innocent in the direct and involuntary killing of an innocent human being. So these passages or these statements are um, statements about abortion and death penalty. And one thing that we know about these things is that the main point of those statements is their claim and their stand pagdating sa sanctity of life, of how they value or how do we really value the sanctity of life. And yun yung, yung common denominator nitong mga statements na to. But if we are to look at it, as we continuously look at it, based on those things na in-announced before, and as we look back yung huling announcement or huling passage or huling writing na nakita natin, 1995, it's almost 20 years already. Almost two decades na. Tama ba? Hindi. 30. 30 na pala. <laughs> Ngayon ako 30 plus, oh, almost 30 years na, ganun nakatagal. And if we are going to look back 30 years after these things, ano na ba yung status ng mga bagay or sa world pagdating sa death penalty and abortion? And one thing that we could acknowledge here is, according to WHO, every year in the world, every year in the world, there are around 73 million induced abortion per year. 73 million. Gano'ng kadami yun? Mas madami pa sa kalahati ng population natin dito sa Pilipinas. Inab- Ganon kadami. Ang induced. Ibig sabihin, it is intentional. It is applied to, to, to them. And it corresponds to approximately 200,000 abortions per day. That's the reality of what is happening right now. And so the question is, why, it is, why is it that it's so different now? Bakit, ba't ganito yung nangyayari ngayon? And hindi lang siya reality, but even in the US, talagang pinopromote yun. Pinopromote yung abortion, pinopondohan ng government ang abortion. And they themselves are really encouraging them to, to commit that. And so, bakit ganun yung nangyayari ngayon? So what's the reality about this? What's the truth about this? And the another question is, what does the Bible really says or say about this matter? Ano pa talaga yung sinasabi ng Bible pagdating sa matter na to? And the last question about this is that, is, they, is this our main topic for today? And which the answer is no. Hindi naman yun yung topic natin ngayon. But it is part These two things, itong abortion and death penalty, kasama siya sa ating meditation today as we discuss God's Word. Kasi tayo po ay tutuloy na sa ating series pagdating sa topic of covenant theology. 
specifically now we will be talking about God's covenant to Noah. Yan po ang ating topic. At babalik na po tayo sa ating series. Alam ko po, ang last na topic natin about covenant theology was, I think, last week of June, if I'm not mistaken. Ata, I think. Kasi sunod-sunod tayo uh, last uh, July. Ay, July pala ngayon. So, last week of May pala. So, the first part, para lang magkaroon tayo ng review, yung first part ng, ng mga na-discuss natin about covenant theology is first, the covenant of God to Adam. And dalawang parts yun. Dalawang parts yung naging sermon pagdating sa covenant of God with Adam. Yung part one is, do this and you shall live. It talks about uh, God's covenant of works with Adam. And the second part, yung sumunod na Sunday, is God's covenant with Adam part 2 it it means let us make man in our own image so yun yung yun yung dalawang topics na napag-usapan natin pagdating sa God's covenant or covenant theology tas ngayon pag-uusapan naman natin yun nga yung covenant ng Lord kay Noah yung covenant ng Lord ng ating Diyos kay Noah at pagdating kay Noah pagdating sa story ni Noah May dalawang narrative, may dalawang narrative na sobrang familiar sa atin pag pinag-usapan natin si Noah. And what are the, those two narratives? The first narrative is that the, uh, the understanding or the story about the great flood. That's the first narrative that is very familiar to all of us. The second narrative is also what we have read earlier is the rainbow after the flood. That's the second narrative na sobrang familiar sa atin. pagdating sa story na to. And these two narratives, itong nabanggit natin, reveal to us God's two-part covenant with Mo- Noah. These two narratives will reveal to us God's two-part covenant with Noah since it is because the first, the great flood, reveals the first part of God's covenant with Noah, specifically His saving grace or His special saving grace to Noah and his family through the ark. That's the first part. And the second part, the rainbow, it reveals the second part in which God's, it is God's common grace towards all human beings. So yun yung dalawang part na yun. At dito makikita natin that the doctrine of special grace as distinct from common grace, yung differences ng special grace and common grace arose out of some of the most frequently asked questions in reality, in rea- not just in reality, in Christianity. Ang mga, ang mga usual na tanong would be, why is, it, why is it that even unbelievers, bakit nga ba kahit yung mga in- unbelievers, they enjoy the benefits of God's providential care? Bakit nga ba kahit mga unbelievers na ta- nararanasan yung, yung, yung providential work and care ng ating Panginoon? Now, another question is, how is it that the earth still produces good harvest? Knowing that the earth has been cursed because of sin, why is it that there is still a good harvest? Others would have this question, so why do unbelievers would still do good works? Knowing that all of us are sinful and knowing that, yes, it can be understandable for believers to do good works, for elect, for the regenerate people to do good works, Pero bakit normally pa rin, even unbelievers can do good works? Why, are, uh, why do unbelievers still are gifted pagdating sa arts? Bakit marami pa rin unbelievers na gifted pagdating sa sciences, sa technology, sa knowledge about the reality? Bakit nga ba even unbelievers can know and perform proper justice when, it, when needed? And even if all creation is now under God's curse because of sin, Why is it still so na nagaha, nangyayari ito, even to unbelievers? At itong mga gifts na ito, itong mga nabanggit natin gifts, ito yung mga blessings na binigay ng ating banal na espiritu sa lahat ng tao at sa buong creation. Ito ay tinatawag na common grace. That is what you or we call common grace. And Jesus teaches this, Um, he teaches this in simple terms in Matthew 5.45. Matthew 5.45, it says, For God makes His Son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Na inaalaw niya na 
Um, ang tawag dito sa Tagalog, tumaas ang araw. Sumikat ang araw. Both sa just and unjust. At inalaw niya na magkaroon ng ulan. Both to believers and unbelievers. And dito makikita natin that God gives this gifts even to undeserving and unrepentant sinners. God is continuously providing and giving to unrepentant sinners. Pero dito makikita natin na hindi naman natatapos sa covenant or sa common grace lamang. Hindi ito natatapos lang sa common grace na pinag-uusapan natin ngayon. Because we know that there is something else and something greater than common grace. Because God blesses all His chosen ones with His special saving grace. Sa unbelievers and believers, he has the, we have and we acknowledge this common grace. But to, his, to the believers, to his people, to his elect, we acknowledge and we can know that there is this special saving grace that was given to them, to us. And this grace is given by the Holy Spirit to all whom God wants to redeem from the, their slavery to sin and Satan. At alam natin kung ano yung grace na to. Pag sinabi natin grace, ito ay yung unmerited favor na tinatawag. And when we talk about unmerited favor, it simply means it is a gift towards undeserving sinners to save them from His wrath. Sa Tagalog, ito ay ang mga biyaya, ang, mga, ang pabor at pagpapala at habag ng ating Panginoon sa mga taong hindi karapat dapat sa pagpapala at pabor niya. dahil sa kanilang kasalanan at sila ay niligtas mula sa galit at poot ng Diyos. And even Apostle Paul defines this special saving grace implicitly in Ephesians 2 verse 4 to 5 and verse 8 to 9. Sabi sa Ephesians 2 verse 4 to 5, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, that even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together in Christ or with Christ. Then in verse 8 to 9, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is only by grace, and we know that. And this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So that is our theme for today. God's two-part covenant with Noah under two headings. Ang first heading po natin is, But I will establish my covenant with you. That is the special grace. And the second heading would be, I have set my bow in the cloud. And that is common grace. So before tayo po ay mag-proceed, let's all bow down our heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that we are about to hear today, Panginoon. We ask and we humbly ask before you that may you sanctify your word and enable it to minister to us. And may you feed us, Father, and may give us peace and rest today. Prepare our hearts and allow us to have a humble, hungry, and earn. Um, eager, O oh Father, to know your word, to be guided by your word, and to be transformed by your word only through the work of your spirit. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So first heading po tayo. First heading, but I will establish my covenant with you, special grace. Ayun po. So sa first heading po natin, kung babasahin natin, if we are going to look back or look up, kasi po ang binasa natin yung sa middle part ng Genesis 6. Ngayon po, kung babasahin natin yung Genesis 6 verses 1 to 4, sa time ni Noah, makikita natin dito na finalfeel ng tao yung mandate ng Diyos kay Adam, in which diniscuss natin yon nung second part ng ating sermon series sa Covenant of Works. Ano ba yung mandate ng Diyos kay Adam? The mandate of war, or one of the mandate is to be fruitful and multiply. It was God's mandate to Adam and Eve that they go and multiply and fill the earth. Pero dito makikita natin sa verses 1 to 4, makikita natin na hindi naging ganun kaganda. Hindi naging ganun kaganda ang naging resulta ng pagdami ng population. Bakit? Bakit hindi naging ganun kaganda? Because man is inherently sinful after the fall. So it shows 
that wickedness also multiplied. So yung pag-grow and pag-multiply ng tao, kaakibat nun, pag-grow and pag-multiply ng wickedness sa creation niya, wickedness sa mundo niya. At dito, in-explain pa or describe pa sa, sa verses na to na the godly line of Seth, ibig sabihin, pagdating sa mga anak ni Adam and Eve, there are two lines. The lines that the sons of God and the lines of the sons of, of the enemy or yung lineage na yon. So dito sinasabi na the godly line of Seth means or hence the sons of God intermarried the evil line of Cain, the daughters of men. And this uh, intermarriage nung dalawang lineage na to produced mighty men the men of renown. At etong mga mighty men na to, ito tinatawag sila ng mga ancient celebrities of war. Sila yung gifted talaga pagdating dito. Very influential, not just in their impact, but even in their wickedness. Ito yung nakikita natin dito. And yung narrative nung time na yon, sa first part ng Genesis 6, isa pa sa nakikita natin, na pinakita dito, is that God grieved that the wickedness of man was so great Nakita natin dito that God grieved that the wickedness of man was so great that sabi sa Genesis 6, Genesis 6 verse 5, every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And can you imagine that? Can you imagine that setting that every man, every intention and thoughts of men and in his heart was only evil continually. And that's the sad reality and the worst and dark reality of what's happening or yung narrative nung time na yun. Tapos makikita din natin dito na he decreed to destroy all humanity after 120 years. Yun yung nasa verse 3. Na sinabi niya, I will decree that humans would just survive for 120 years. Yung ibang interpretation doon sinasabi na hanggang 120 lang yung edad ng tao in which it might not be applicable as an interpretation for that since alam naman natin even after that maraming character sa Bible na nagtagal at nabuhay ng more than 120 years. So this seems to be a timeline pagdating doon sa decree ng Lord about the flood, about that. But there is... Even sa ganong dark side ng reality sa narrative ng Genesis 6, there is one little good news na makikita natin sa Genesis 6. And that is in the verse 8. Sabi sa verse 8, But Noah found favor in the eyes of God. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Dito makikita natin that God remembered his first gospel proclamation, his first promise in Genesis 3 verse 15 kay Adam and Eve where he promised a seed from Eve, the seed from Eve, Eve would crush the head of Satan, the ancient serpent. Eh, pero dito makikita natin sa promise nito na the seed who is Jesus Christ, the coming Messiah, would suffer a bruise on his hill. Ito yung promise na yun. Pero bago pa naman tayo lumipat sa sunod na senaryo, pagdating sa reality, sa narrative nito, maganda rin na makita natin tong bagay na to. That Noah is the only one whom the Lord have favored. Sabi nga doon, but Noah found favor in the eyes of God. Pero kung inunote natin, Even if Noah is the only one whom the Lord favored, but his whole family was saved also from the flood. Isa yun sa nakikita natin or observations na pwede natin makita dito. At babalikan natin yun mamaya. Then pupunta tayo sa susunod na narrative. Sabi doon, Then the Lord then commanded Noah to build an ark to save his family and all the known creatures of the earth that time. Yun yung naging command sa kanya na bum, gumawa siya ng ark, gumawa siya ng malaking malaking barko o bangka, hindi ko alam, basta ark. And doon yung family niya at saka lahat ng kilalang hayop nung time na yun. At dito maganda rin nating tandaan, konting side note natin dito, na ang lahat ng hayop na dinala sa ark, lahat ng hayop na dinala doon, they comes or they came in pairs. They came in na both lalaki at babae. 
laging pares yun. Na da, may isang may isang leon na lalaki, may isang leon na babae, may isang asong lalaki, may isang asong babae. Of every kind, sa lahat ng uri ng hayop na pumunta sa ark noong time na yun. And dito, we could see clearly Adam and Eve, male and female, and every sort of creatures, male and female, were for the purpose of repro reproduction, for to, multipl um, to multiply and fill the earth. It's only male and female. Mula creation pa lang, mga kapatid, patuloy natin makikita na walang institution ng same-sex marriage or same-sex union of any creature. It's only male and female. At pagkatapos bigyan sila ng Panginoon ng instructions na yun, God promised him in Genesis 6 verse 18, But I will establish my covenant with you and you shall come into the ark. Yan ang sabi ng Panginoon. Pero hindi natapos doon. You, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And dito mababalikan natin yung tangi, na tanging si Noah lang ang nakatanggap ng favor sa Panginoon pero sinama ng ating Panginoon ang kanyang buong pamilya sa salvation plan niya. It's not just Noah. Diba? It's not just Noah and his wife for the sake of reproduction. It's not just... Pero hindi, hindi lang si Noah and his wife. It's not just Noah and his wife and his son, but Noah, his wife, and his son, and his son's wives were part of that promise. Therefore, Noah was the head of God's covenant with him. Ang covenant na to ay tinatawag na covenant or God's covenant of grace or part of God's covenant of grace to him. Yung covenant grace of grace na to, it is a grace that God gives only to those whom He had chosen. Ito'y para lamang sa mga pinili niya. From eternity past, before He created the heavens and the earth. At ito, itong grace na to na binigay ng ating Diyos kay Noah is a special grace. Itong grace or habag na binigay or pagpapalang ito, this is a special grace. This is an amazing grace that saved sinners who do not deserve anything from God, much less any grace from God. And this was a special grace since no one else in this world or in that world or during his time received such grace that Noah received. And totoo naman yun. Ganun siya ka-special na if you are going to look at it, among all the people who were living during that time, in his generation, in that time, it is only him and his family who has received that grace. No one else. No one else. And that is the grace of God. And in the words of Canons of Dort, first head of doctrine of divine predestination, Article 15, it says here, Not all people have been chosen, but that some have not been chosen or have been passed by in God's eternal election to leave them in the common misery into which by their own fault, again, by their own fault, they have plunged themselves not to grant them saving faith and the grace of conversion. And as we could see here, God left the rest of mankind who perished in the flood in their totally depraved, sinful condition. At hindi niya binigyan sila ng kanyang special grace or special saving faith. At sa atin naman po mga kapatid, paano naman natin malalaman na tayo ay may ganong special grace? Paano natin malalaman na tayo ay nakatanggap ng special grace mula sa ating Panginoon. And again, God promises in Romans 10, Romans 10 verses 9 to 10, Romans 10 verse 9 to 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes is justified And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. If you confess with your mouth, 
and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. That is true. But we have to clarify it. We have to reclarify and we have to establish it. Na itong sinasabi na na to ng scripture, this is not a justification for any works-based salvation. This is not what it means. That mere confession means salvation. Hindi ho yun ang katotohanan. Hindi yun yung interpretation pagdating sa bagay na to. Na if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you, you are saved. You will be saved. No, hindi po siya ganun kasimple. Pag sinabi natin, if you confess with your mouth, it simply means or it implies that your confession or the confession that, is, that it is spoken here is an outward evidence. Again, your confession is an outward evidence of an inward faith. As we are continuously seeing kung paano na structure yung verse, connected sila. It is an outward expression of an inward faith. Kaya sinabi doon, if you confess with your mouth, pero hindi natapos doon, and believe in your heart. And that believe in your heart means if you have faith, if you have faith, and it's not just a simple faith that you believe. It's not the kind of faith na you have the faith na alam mo na kahit umupo ka sa upuan na nandyan kung nasaan ka ngayon nakaupo, hindi yan masisira kahit anong upo mo dyan. That's kind of faith to a, a thing. But when we talk about the faith here, it's not just a simple faith or it's not just a belief in the, in the mind, but it is a true saving faith. That's the faith that we're talking about here. The faith that is given to us by God. And if I may add, it also echoes with the confession in Peter or confession of Peter in Matthew 16, verse 15 to 17. Again, Matthew 16, verse 15 to 17. Sabi dito, He said to them, this is Christ speaking, But who do you say that I am? It is God. It is Christ who is speaking to his people or asking or questioning his disciples. Now, Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ. That is his confession. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. At dito makikita natin that Jesus acknowledged it, acknowledges it in verse 17. Sabi dito, and Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And it shows that this confession, as sinabi ni Peter, is not just a mere confession, but this is a confession of his personal faith, his saving faith. It is not just a mere academic knowledge of confession, but through faith made possible from a divinely regenerate heart. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, so we are to publicly declare our faith. Publicly declare your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior and wholeheartedly believe that He was raised from the dead. And this is your assurance that the Spirit has granted you His special grace. Your true faith. A profession of faith from a possession of God's saving faith. A profession of faith from a possession of God's saving faith. And this is the grace, the special grace that has been granted to Noah and his family as we go back. This is the grace, the special grace that has been granted to his family. At ano yung image ng covenant of grace, that special saving grace na, na ito kay Noah? The image is the ark. The image is the ark that saved his family. And that is the picture of our Lord Jesus Christ who saves His people from all his, their sins. The ark that saved the family of Noah points to Christ that saves His people from the wrath of God. That is the, um, the image that points towards Christ and His redemptive work. So that's our first point. The special grace of God in which God promised to Noah. And this is the second point, mga kapatid. The second point is, I have set my bow in the cloud in which it reminds us or it speaks to us of the God's 
common grace. Pagdating sa second part ng ating sermon, the second part of God's covenant of grace with Noah is being expounded more sa Genesis chapter 9 na pinasa natin kanina. After the flood waters subsided, after humupa ng baha, na alam ko marahil iba sa atin dito very familiar din sa nangyayari pag humuhupa yung baha, yung, kal- yung calmness, na, na, yung relief na nararamdaman natin pag mga ganun bagay. At kung babalikan natin, yung promise na yon na pinakita na or sinabi ng Diyos kila Noah, kung ibabalik natin yon kay Adam and Eve, makikita natin yung ganong picture as well, yung ganong narrative as well. Kasi binigyan ng ating Diyos si Adan at si Eva ng as husband and wife that they were given this mandate to be fruitful and multiply. Yun yung mandate ng ating Diyos. To fill the earth and to multiply and fill the earth. At hindi lang natatapos doon. They are also mandated to be stewards of creation. It simply means that they have dominion over creation, that they are to subdue creation. And as God's workers, they were also commanded to till and guard the garden. And kung titignan natin yung parallelism nun, after the flood, ganun din yung nakikita natin, that God repeated the same mandate to Noah. Na nabasa natin kanina sa Genesis 5, that, and God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. It was again reiterated and mandated to Noah as well na nakikita natin yung parallelism nun. But there was a significant difference, mga kapatid. There was a certain or significant difference pagdating sa covenant ni God kay Adam and kay Noah. With God's covenant with Adam, prior, prior the fall of man, it was the covenant of works na tinatawag natin, which we have heard and we have listened to previous Sundays ago. Eh, anong ibig sabihin ng God's covenant of works as a review? It simply means that they were placed under the probation in the covenant of works. They were placed in a pro- probation. Ibig, ibig sabihin, they were placed in a testing. And, and ano yung test na yun? Based on the commandment of God. That if they disobeyed God, they shall surely die. If they disobey, disobeyed the commandment of God, they will experience death. But if they obeyed, they will be given eternal life or they will enjoy and experience eternal life. And however, sa nakita nating narrative sa Genesis, alam natin that after that, Adam failed and they disobeyed God. So his perfect image of God's righteousness and holiness, yung image na yon, and yung communion na meron siya with God was corrupted by sin. It was corrupted by sin. At dahil siya ang federal head ng buong mankind, his sin affected the whole human race. Hindi lang si Adam, hindi lang si Eve na nakakain ng knowledge of the fruit of good and evil ang affected by sin. But the whole human race. At lahat ng tao ay naging alipi ng kasalanan. Slaves of sin. At ano na naging effect nun? Makikita natin kung babasahin natin yung naging story kay Adam and Eve. After that, in their generation, then in their next generations, makikita natin yung sinful nature na yun is continuously being evident. Kasi this sinful nature then caused his son, Cain, to murder his brother, Abel. Yun yung story na alam natin, that Cain um, killed Abel. And therefore, because of sin, God's covenant with Noah was of grace. Because of sin in human race, God's covenant with Noah was of grace in which is the same with the promise given to Adam and Eve after the fall. At nung na-establish ng ating Panginoon ang kanyang covenant kay Noah, it was of grace na. It's not anymore by works because he is already an undeserving sinner when God is establishing his covenant to him. And as we can see in verse 8, Kung babalikan natin yung verse 8 in which dito nakalagay doon that Noah found favor in God's eyes. He was considered, sabi dito, he was considered a righteous man. 
Kasi syempre, pinag-uusapan natin undeserved. Pero dito nakalagay, He was considered a righteous man, blameless in his generation. That was, was, that was the description pagdating kay Noah. Pero dito, titingnan natin mabuti na even though it was declared that he was ri- a righteous man or a blameless man, dito makikita natin that it is not in an absolute sense. Na pag sinabi na he was a righteous and a blameless man, it doesn't mean that it is in an absolute sense, but it simply means na if it was to be compared to other men during that time. Sa kaya sinabi dito, he was blameless in his generation. So the comparison is not between Noah and the righteousness of God, but the comparison is between Noah and the righteousness of other men. Doon nakikita na stand up or nakikita na lutang na lutang yung righteousness and blamelessness ni Noah. Now in this covenant, God made two promises sa covenant na ito. that included not only Noah and his family, but the whole human race. Hindi lang ang kanyang pamilya ang nakaranas ng covenant promise na binigay ng Diyos sa kanya, kundi yung buong human race nakaranas ng promise na to at naging uh, recipient ng promise na to kay Noah. Kaya nga dito masasabi natin that this is part of God's common grace. Dito na tayo mag deal sa discussion or uh, description ng common grace ng ating Panginoon. Dito babalikan natin that God's promise is that He will protect the sanctity of life. Yan yung pinaka-hope or pinaka-root or pinaka-foundation itong promise na to That He will protect the sanctity of life. Kasi kung maalala natin at babalikan natin, Cain already murdered his brother. Nagkaroon na ng, ng first murder. Cain already murdered his brother. Pero hindi natapos doon. Hindi lang kay Cain nagkaroon ng sin of murder. After generations under Cain's line, isa sa mga descendant ni Cain, meron tayong makikilala na tinatawag na si Lamech. Si Lamech, ganun din yung nangyari. He boasted to his two wives. Ngayon, dugtong-dugtong na yung mga ano, nakikita natin. He boasted to his two wives that he killed a man in excessive revenge for striking and wounded him. Pinagmamalaki niya sa dalawang anak asawa niya na nakapatay siya ng tao nang dahil lang nasaktan siya. Ang revenge na ginawa niya, he murdered that person. And it's very familiar even up to now. Pero dito makikita natin that in protecting human life, no one, eh dito it was also commanded, that no one must eat any flesh with blood because blood represents life. Then God declared to Noah, isa sa mga binanggit dito sa Genesis 9 verse 6, God declared to Noah, whoever sheds the blood of man, again, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. And this is a clear statement from the Holy Scriptures that the capital punishment in which nabanggit natin kanina is God's penalty for murderers and homicide. And even in the law of Moses, marami tayong makikitang examples or cases ng murder and homicide that deserves death penalty. Maraming mga cases at nakadescribe yon sa law of Moses. Pero hindi naman lahat ng pag nakamatay ka or nakapatay ka dapat death penalty agad. Kasi meron din namang mga uh, reservations or meron namang inclusions don na pagdating sa cases of manslaughter or it's in short parang unintentional killing, it doesn't deserve any death penalty na nakalsaad doon. Pero dito makikita na natin that even after sin, what something we can observe here is that even after sin, even after the fall of men, even if after the man has been corrupted by sin, all human beings still carry the image of God though corrupted and tainted by sin. And that's the reality. And what we can observe right now is that most nations today, even us included here in the Philippines, have eliminated the death penalty even for the most heinous murderers and serial killers. 
And dito makikita natin that there are Christians as well who are, who are against capital punishment. Maraming mga Kristiyano din naman talaga na against capital punishment. They argue that only God, the creator of life, can take life. They argue that the God's law in Genesis 9:6 and yung law of Moses, they are all obsolete. Yun yung claim nila. They were all being obsolete by the law of love, mercy, and forgiveness in the New Testament. That's their claim. However, God's statement to Noah and the law of Moses are strengthened as well and encouraged as well in the New Testament in Paul's teaching, so Romans 13 verse 4, when he talks about submission to the government or the authority. Sabi ng Romans 13 verse 4, a governing authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. And dito makikita na natin that the civil authority imposes capital punishment on murderers because he is the instrument of God's vengeance and wrath on murderers. Why? Because murderers don't value the sanctity of life. Those murderers who willfully killed men or people don't value life and its sanctity. And if you would allow me to add, meron namang mga nag argue na paano naman yung mga buhay ng murderer? Kasi totoo naman, totoo may value yung napatay nila. Paano yung buhay ng murderer? They have value as well. They have, may sanctity din yung buhay nila. They have value as well. Tulad ng sinasabi ng Roman Catholic statement na binasa natin kanina. At tamay naman yun. Pero meron sinabi or may quote si R.C. Sproul pagdating dito sa debate na to. And it says here, I agree that the murderer's life is valuable and all of that. Totoo naman yun. Even the murderer's life is valuable. But the point of the debate is which view has a higher view of life? If the motive for capital punishment is vengeance or revenge, then God hates that. That is not the view, or that is not a proper view of why this is um, imposed. But the moral justification for capital punishment is because, is because God says human life is so important, so sacred, that if somebody else willfully, maliciously goes and murders another human being, they forfeit their right to life. And in addition to all of this, since the penalty of sin is death beginning from Adam, all human beings bear God's death penalty for even a single sin. For all the, way, for the wages of sin is death. At lagi nating tatandaan, there is no human being that deserves not to die because we all sin. Again, there is no human being that deserves not to die because of sin except one. Except one, and that is the righteous one. But he also died, not for his sins, but for he has none, but for our sins, and that is Jesus Christ. All of us here deserves to die because of our sin. And there is one man who doesn't even deserve to die. He is life in itself, but chose to die, not for his sin, but for our sake. Kaya nga sabi sa 2 Corinthians 5.21, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And that's the reality pagdating sa katotohanan na to. At meron namang nagsasabi na mga tao na pro-capital punishment, kasi yun yung mga um, description sa kanila, merong pro-capital punishment Tapos anti-abortion. At sinasabi na inconsistent yung style nila. Kasi pag sinabi na pro-capital punishment ka, tapos anti-abortion ka, parang contradicting. Kasi if anti-abortionists protect the sanctity of life, why, did, why do they support death penalty? Pero dito makikita natin that death penalty is different from adoption. 
uh, uh, from abortion sorry it is different it it is a different case kasi when it, we talk about abortion the bible is clear abortion is the murder of a human being in the womb abortion is murder of a human being in the womb the life in the womb is a human being at conception ibig sabihin even in conception there is life already hindi siya yung pag lumabas na doon palang lang i-acknowledge na life kasi dito makikita natin na even David says that he was already a sinner even at conception in Psalms 51 verse 5 sabi dito behold I was brought forth in, in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me and he confirms it or reiterates it in Psalms 139 verse 13 for you have formed my inward sp- inward parts speaking of God you knitted me together in my wo- mother's womb so dito pinapakita na at the moment of conception pa lang nakita na natin agad yung creative work ng ating Panginoon we can never say that wala pang life doon and even sa Exodus 21 22 to 25 pinrotektahan ng ating Diyos through that law ang mga sanggol na hindi pa pinapanganak doon sa mga buntis na natamaan for example accidentally ng lalaki habang nag-aaway kasi sabi sa Exodus 21:22-23 when men strive together kunyari may nag-aaway na dalawang lalaki and hit a pregnant woman may naapektuhan o may natamaang isang buntis na babae so that her child so that her children come out but there is no harm the one who hit her shall surely be fined as the woman's husband shall impose on him and he shall pay as the judges determine pero sabi sa verse 23 but if there is harm then you shall pay life for life life for life ibig sabihin patuloy na pinapakita dito that even in conception there is life already Hindi yung pinapakita at pinaririnig natin ngayon na sobrang alarming. Kasi sinasabi nila na it's my body. I can decide whatever I want as long as it is inside me. Pero hindi lang siya part ng isang tao. Hindi lang siya part ng isang katawan. As if may right ka kasi katawan mo yun. There is another life within your body and that's the truth about it. It's not just a part of your body, but there is life within your body. Kaya nga in Jeremiah 1 verse 5, God told the prophet, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. And even in the New Testament, ganun din yung sinasabi sa story ni John the Baptist. Na kahit na yung nasa womb pa lang siya ng kanyang ina, nakilala na agad siya ni Jesus. Yun yung sa Luke 1, 39 to 45. Na parehas pa lang silang nasa loob ng chan, pero may certain acknowledgement na. Kaya nga in God's word, in the word of God, abortion is murder. Again, in the word of God, according to God's word, abor- abortion is murder. And in human conscience, not just in the Word of God, but even in our human conscience na lang, in an human conscience, abortion is still murder because there is always the, there, was, there will always be a fel- feeling of guilt after the deed. Na kahit na hindi kristyano at kahit na hindi nila alam, kung ano yung sinasabi ng salita ng Diyos, alam nila na mali yung ginawa nila. That there will still be um, a guilt or there will have that feeling of guilt after that deed. At dito makikita natin yung second promise ng ating Diyos kay Noah and all human beings after Him. Na yun yung common grace and when it comes to the sanctity of life, the work of life. And even in Genesis 9, 9 to 17, in this common co- covenant of common grace, God will set a rainbow in the clouds pagkatapos ng mga ulang ulan. There will always be a rainbow. And this is His covenant sign that He will not destroy all human beings and living creatures again by a flood. 
Yun naman yung pangako niya pagdating sa pangakong ito. He will not destroy all human beings and living creatures again by flood. And even a pastor theologian have said this or noted that perhaps the rainbow is a bow with an invisible arrow pointing upwards to God himself together with his promise of his assurance that he himself would suffer the death penalty if he violated his covenant promise and which alam naman natin that this is of course impossible dahil nung ang ating Panginoong Jesus ang anak ng Diyos ay ipinako sa krus at namatay hindi ito dahil sa violate niya ang kanyang pangako kay Noah because he was pierced to save his chosen people for violating God's covenant laws That's why in Romans 5.8, but God shows us His love for us, or God shows His love for us, in that while we will still still sinners, Christ died for us. And as we end, mga kapatid, beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, after Noah and his family disembarked from the ark, They offered burnt offerings to thank and praise God for saving them. Then God declared to him in Genesis 8:22, "While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease." That's the declaration and promise of God. na hanggang sa huli, magpapadala at magpapadala pa rin ang ating Diyos, ang ating Panginoon, ng ulan, ng araw, ng snow, ng good harvest, ng seasons, and every seasons and seasons in every year. For He is the good providence for all mankind. He is the good providence of all mankind. However, it is also God alone who determines when the earth shall cease to exist. Ito yung in contrary sa mga sinasabi ng mga tao that na malapit na daw, magunaw ang mundo sa ganitong taon, sa ganitong panahon. But we all know that it is still God who declares and knows when and at, at until when the earth will cease to exist. Kasi hindi kayang sirain ng tao ang creation ng ating Diyos na buhay. Hindi kayang sirain ng tao ang creation ng Diyos. Hindi sa carbon emissions from oil and gas at kung sa mga smoke belching na sasakyan. Only God and He alone knows the day when His patience will run out and all wicked ma- on all wicked mankind as in the evil days of Noah. Then He will punish all evildoers. He will punish all evildoers. Not, but not by flood. Pag dumating na yung araw na yun, vengeance will come. God's vengeance to those who hate Him, to those who do not repent of their sins, of those who practice idolatries, idolatries of those murderers, of those who are sexually immoral, of those who are greedy, and those who are liars. God will show His vengeance to them. Pero paano nga niya ipapakita yung vengeance na yun, mga kapatid? He will purge the earth, not anymore by flood, but with fire. Only those who are faithful and endure sufferings and persecution to the end will be saved. Pero hindi po dito natatapos lahat. Hindi dito natatapos yung story. Hindi natatapos sa ganitong image lang ang story ng ating Diyos. ang promise niya sa bawat isa sa atin. God will not just completely destroy the earth and its wicked people. It's not the end of it. He also promises that He will restore the earth. He will restore the earth to its pristine and perfect state. A better garden of Eden. A better paradise restored. Sabi nga sa Romans 8, 18-21, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. It is nothing if to be compared to the glory that will be revealed to us. 
Verse 19, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futil futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. That is the hope that we are looking for. That is the hope that we are hoping for. That, that is the promise and the future that we look forward. For we know that the consummation of all things will come. The justice shall be served. And even if we would always see a lot of injustices in this world, a lot of malpractices, a lot of unfair approaches, a lot of sinful men, being free from the justice of man. Pero patuloy pa rin tayong i-comfort ng Panginoon na walang makakaligtas sa justicia ng ating Diyos. Justice shall be served by our righteous judge and by our majestic redeemer. He will redeem his people and by our glorious king, he, we would witness again the coming of Jesus Christ. And everything will be at peace. And there will be a new heaven and a new earth where he will dwell with his people whom he will restore to his image of perfect righteousness and holiness. Amen. Let us all bow down our heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that has spoken us today. We ask that may you alone guide us and direct us more to you and your word. We have witnessed your goodness, O God, and your glory with the exhortation of your grace. And we acknowledge that all of us here are sinners and don't deserve any goodness, blessing, or favor from you. What we only deserve is your wrath, for you are a holy, righteous, and good God, and we are not. But we thank you, O Lord, that you have chosen us and redeemed us through your Son. He who knew no sin became sin for us. He paid for our sins and received your wrath. And we were not just left redeemed from sin, but also restored and imputed his righteousness to us. We ask, O Lord, that may you teach us and always remind us of his work, of his redemptive work, not just to us believers, but for the favor, the grace that you have granted to all of us, both believers and unbelievers. May you forgive us, of, O Lord, of our sins. Forgive us of our tendency to take your grace and mercy for granted. Forgive us if there were times that we murmur, O Lord, for times that we complain about the inconveniences of life, of our sufferings, for the weather, for the inconveniences, the hot weather, the temperature, the uneasiness, O Lord. If we complain and desire for things that don't belong to us, forgive us if we think that we deserve better. Forgive us if we demand more and more than what we have now. Forgive us, O Lord, but always remind us, O Lord, of your truth. Remind us of your grace, that these sufferings, these challenges, or inconveniences that we are experiencing right now are just little, or even nothing, if to be compared to the wrath that we deserve from you because of, your, because of our sins. And always po point us to your grace. Allow us to see your grace in the light of your truth so that we will not take it for granted. We will not take your grace for granted, but learn to live in gratitude, knowing that we are yours, that we can have hope. That the other side of the picture is this, that these things would be nothing, not just our sufferings, but also even the best things in this world has to offer. Everything is nothing if to be compared to the glory that is prepared for us in your coming, for us to witness the fullness of your glory. 
And may we desire nothing in this world but you alone, O Lord, our joy, our hope, our Redeemer, our Savior, our Lord. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. Humble us today and cause us to repent. Enable us to love you more. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.